Good evening and welcome to On Point, where we talk to successful Fijians wherever they may be. I'm Ellen Whippy, your host. The environment is the single most pressing issue the world is facing, and the Pacific is at the forefront of a lot of the challenges we face. Young people of Oceania have led a lot of the demand for more action. Our guest works as a conservation scientist at the International Organization, a youth leader, activist, and all-round familiar face in the Pacific, Alisi Rambukawanga Navewa. Alisi, welcome to On Point. Thank you, Alan. It's lovely to be here. It's just wonderful having you on the show today. Here you are, 32 years old, a mother of four children. You have a role which is so prominent in one of the most pressing issues that is affecting the survival of this earth today. Where you get the time to do it, I don't know. But how did you get into it? I think my story is similar to a lot of other Fijians, Pacific Islanders, um, who are in the work of conservation in marine environment, environmental mm. conservation. You know, we grow up in, with the land. You know, we see the ocean every day. It's a part of our everyday living. And so it's a natural progression that because you're so close and connected to it, when you grow up and you start learning about all these issues that you want to do something to address the problems, to, you know, sort of accentuate the good things about it. So I think that's sort of... Well, you know, we, there, there are 900,000 um, Fijians and people who are Fijian citizens that live in this country, but not all 900,000 stood up and said, right, we're going to do something about this. Yeah. Why did you in particular feel the need? Ah. Oh. It must have hit you somehow. I, yes, and um, my upbringing, just, you know, inspirations around me, um, my family, church, I think those, you know, all these different things came together and sort of molded and directed me in this path. And um, growing up with, uh, you know, this sense of uh, responsibility mm. and stewardship mm. to my environment, it was part of our culture and tradition that, know we have that sense of responsibility and and for me you know I I took it very um, seriously you know I felt okay I really need to do something to help yes and I've always kept that you know yes. you know they always say try and keep a little bit of your childhood so that childhood dream of you know helping the environment helping the fish doing all these things you know yeah. I, I kept that alive and we well, you know, very very well with that because uh, you know when you talk about your childhood um, it brings me to think about your grandfather, because uh, you come from very, very, uh, must have had a very good upbringing coming in you know, having a man, a gentleman like Sir Joshua Rambukawanga, who was um, immediately after Fiji became independent. He was uh, the very first Fijian High Commissioner in London from 1973 to 1976, mm -hmm. and a revered gentleman. So, you know, uh, I can see where you're getting this care about our country and our people from. Did you ever meet him? Yes, um, I did. Uh, he lived with us in the um, last uh, years of his life. Um, I also have memories of him. Um, even at that time, he had, you know, he was very elderly and um, yes. he was wheelchair bound. But um, I remember, you know, singing songs with him. He was also a musician, a music I know. composer. What a gentleman! Uh, yeah. And. Uh, I, I distinctly remember when I was small, I'd always be scared of thunder. And whenever we'd have thunder, I'd run and jump on his lap. And he'd always comfort and protect me. I don't know, that was like one of my favorite memories of him. Right. Um, and then you became, you know, after that, you, uh, you were an ACS graduate. Yes. Um, they seemed to really, pour, you know, really dis pour out all these fantastic people who become great citizens of Fiji. Uh, and then you became Miss Hibiscus, Miss Fiji, and Miss... South Pacific, all in the one year in 2011 before you went on this uh, direction into climate change. How do you think uh, being able to achieve all of that has actually helped in this job that you do now? Well, I think it, it, it goes hand in hand. Um, so, you know, just very brief background to that. The reason I joined was I was part of this youth program and we went to Japan, you know, sponsored by the uh, Cabinet Office of Japan, the Ship for the World Youth. It was two months, we went to Japan, we went on a cruise liner with um, participants from about 12 other countries and Japanese. And it was cultural exchange and learning, different countries. And so when we finished that program, we had to come back and do a post-program activity. 
And we saw the platform for hibiscus as a great opportunity because, you know, it's like, um, I may have the figures wrong, but I remember the time we were talking about how the foot traffic throughout the week is like 300,000, how you have millions of viewers, you know, from Fiji and across the Pacific, through, uh, through the different channels, and how, you know, you could use that platform to amplify a message that you had. Right. And, so the and what was that message? Um, for us, it was how youth can make an impact, um, how they can participate, you know, uh, locally and internationally for learning and also sharing. Yeah. And um, yeah, so that's why we went into Hibiscus because we recognized that platform and that opportunity. And the winning part was what well, I didn't expect. I went in doing my best, and then when I won and then became Miss Fiji, then I got a bigger platform on the South Pacific pageant stage. That's right. And so we continued with that message. And for me, a specific component I added was my environmental advocacy, you know, right. because it was my background. I studied marine science. And at the time, I had just graduated, not yet got a full-time job. And so in the meantime, if I am going to be placing myself out there in the public, I thought, why don't I start to also promote this side of me and what I do, you know, because it, um, it adds value to, mm. you know, your profile, so to and speak. And then you, then you jumped onto a canoe. Yes. And <laughs> off you went um, uh, around the world sailing on that canoe. What was the objective of that? Yeah. The well, Otonialo. Yeah. Well, not around the world. So the, um, the journey was Temano Temoana, talking about, you know, our ocean and how we should protect it because there's so many things happening with, you know, pollution and all these other things, impacts, uh, impacts even of climate change. And um, when I sailed, it was, uh, the journey was towards its end and it was going to Solomon Islands for the Pacific Arts Festival, sort of as a yes. culmination of the thing. So I sailed from Fiji to Vanuatu to the Solomons. And, and for me, it was like a great way to be uh, physically, you know, literally part of the ocean and part of this process because a lot of it had been, you know, like in classrooms, in buildings, talking with people. You were actually in the ocean. Yes, and you're out there and you're seeing the impacts, you know, beyond your reefs. You're seeing what's happening. You're seeing the wildlife and all that stuff. And so it, you know, it brings you closer to home. It, it makes you realize this is what we're fighting for. So what is your major concern for the ocean? Uh, it has to be, um, you know, marine litter, pollution. There is just so much pollution in the ocean. And oh, this, it's such a broad topic. I mean, plastics, you know, you're like from fishing industries, you have all these ghost nets and lines and everything. Um, industrial waste and sewage that's going into our oceans. You know, everyone treats the ocean like it's a dumping ground. You just throw it there, the waves take it away, you forget about it. But, you know, it's limited. The world is one place, and these things continue to stay And the ocean there. currents go round and round and yeah. round, and uh, it lands in somebody's doorstep. Yes, and most of the time it comes back to ours. And so, you know, that's the biggest problem. So when you came back from the Otto Nialo trip, what was the, uh, the, the, the next action from seeing what was in the ocean, seeing that the ocean was depleted, being depleted of its natural sources, which is, you know, f food for us. Yeah. What was your next step from there? Um, well, I had to be realistic, you know. There's so many issues, mm. and you really want to save the world, but you can't drain yourself, right. like, trying to accomplish all these things. So realistic steps. What can I do? I can do something at home. Mm. I can do something here in Fiji. And so part of it for me was engaging in our Boa Urban Youth Network, which is a network of, I'm from Boa, from Nambo Walu in the province of Boa. And so it was engaging, you know, like that part of it is in that network, it's young people from the province who are now in urban areas who have come for education, working, have skills, networks, and how can they use that to help your community again? So I was like trying I to bring it back a home. Great thing to come back to. We're just talking here to young conservation scientist Alisa Rumbukawanga, and in the next segment, we'll learn of some of her work in the youth advocacy movement. So stay with us. <laughs> Oh, 
Welcome back to On Point, and we're talking here with Alisi Rambukawanga Navewa. Alisi is from Moa, where just over 10 years ago, the young people from the province who were now living in the urban area decided they could not stand by and watch the degradation of their traditionally owned natural resources. The Moa urban youth have become quite successful with a group called Bai. Can you just tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, well, you know, as I had like previously alluded to, it was young people from the province, you know, they've come to Silva or gone on to overseas, gotten an education, networks, working professionally, and asking ourselves, how can we use that to give back to Boa? Um, and it wasn't limited to looking at environmental degradation or anything. It was really, what does our Vanua need and how can we help? And um, the, I guess what happened was the bauxite mining. Oh, that was dreadful. Yeah, so when that came up, you know, there was so many conflicting stories. Like media was saying the communities wanted it, they were happy, this is in a white level. Um, and then we're hearing from the communities that, you know, a different story. And so a, a, a group of us from the uh, network went to the ground to, for ground truthing just to see. To the what, actual site yeah. where that bauxite mining yeah. was happening yeah. and affecting the waterways there. Because one Women's thing I... fishing grounds, the yes. plantations, yes. the access, um, and, and it wasn't matching up. And so, you know, that was what was needed, the help, to help them speak out and see what kind of avenues they can access, um, you know, to get justice. Because what was done to them was wrong. So w were the fishing grounds actually destroyed? Um, well, uh, I, n I never actually went to the site. I only read um, uh, some of the reports that came back. And it said that um, because of all the mining, it's open cut mining. And a lot of the soil was washing into the rivers. And it was all muddied out. And they couldn't find, the women said it was, they couldn't go and fish there anymore. They couldn't go and get. the water turned red. Yeah. And the eels were coming out of there. The black eels were coming out red. Yeah. Because the color had changed from mm. the natural colors of the soil, yeah. of the, uh, the mud in the, in the waterways. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, you know, I guess a part of me is like, you know, there's always supposed to be scientific data and mm. to back it, but, and there's w anecdotal, but there's still value in that because they've been fishing and using those areas for generations, and they've seen those changes and they're saying it. And so, you know, we should recognize the value of the information that they're sharing as well and to say, hey, there really is a problem here we should do something about it. But I think it. there's another major issue there, though. Yes. And that issue has to be the policing of the people that are mining and the laws and the rules and regulations and the policies that allow them to do it in an environmental, in a way that does not destroy the environment. And was that part of Yes. By? Yes, that's, yeah, that was also part of it all. And, um, you know, I, I think that you know, our legislations are great. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's sort of like the effect of as you move further away from the urban areas, it's difficult to monitor mm -hmm. a lot of things and enforce a lot of things happening. And, you know, that was the issue because it was so far away from uh, the urban centers, you know, it's hard to see what's going on, what the company You didn't have doing. anybody stationed there? Um, there was, I mean, like in an ideal situation, there would be, but it's hard. You know, it, it doesn't happen that way in reality, right. as much as we, we hope or wish for it to be. Hmm. Yeah. Right. And so what became, what has become of BUY, and BUY is B-U-Y. More urban youth, More yes. urban youth. Uh, how strong are they in, um, in the activity in Boa? Um, well, I, how can I, so since then, you know, a lot of other issues have come up. Um, you know, there were plans to extend um, uh, exploration and extraction to another district in Wainunu. Um, and for us, we recognize that communities need development. They also need um, sources of employment and, you know, mm -hmm. money and all these things, economy, right? We cannot just go in and say, don't do those things because, you know, it's bad for the environment. We have to recognize they also want to level up, right? Right. And so for us, it was like, what's the best way um, 
to frame this. And so it became about free prior informed consent. And it's a process right. that you use in development. Right. Ensuring that these communities, before development happens, you know, are free to make uh, informed decisions on their own. You give them all the information and then they decide, which wasn't what happened in a way level. They no. didn't understand a lot of the things that they agreed to. And so for us, it was like, let's go in, give them all the information, and let them decide then for themselves, as opposed to going in and tell them, say no to mining. Hmm. Because that's the best you can do. You can't tell communities what to do. No, you can't tell communities what to do. They need to be able to make those decisions themselves. Empower because them. They, they, to empower them, but they live there. They know what they need. Yep. How has by worked with government to ensure that what happened at the bauxite mining, mm. in the bauxite mining situation does not reoccur? For us, I think um, part of that was engaging in a lot of uh, consultation and government processes. You know, um, when government calls for submissions for bills, we participate. Um, when government calls for consultations, you know, before the UN Oceans Conference, we were having consultations. We signed up, we walked into the room, we sat down, we put our hands up, we asked questions, participating in there. Mm. So not only are we working on the ground and you know, seeing the communities directly, but also coming into these national spaces, into these forums, to also speak there. Mm. Yeah, so that's, that's part of the process. Um, to what extent we have been effective, I couldn't really say. Um, but you know, I am thankful that for that space and opportunity that we have continued to engage. We are well, your voices are being heard, and you yeah. can't stop, right? Yeah, because uh, if you do, uh, you know, this just continues mm -hmm. uh, to the de detriment of the the communities. Yeah, and yeah, and for us, you know, it's so important to participate, and that's one thing you are, you know, when mm -hmm. talking about youth engagement, right. you can't just sit back and 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 look and say things. You have to mm -hmm. go into the room, go into the space, yes. and participate there as well. It's been really fabulous talking to you, Alisi, about the Moa urban youth. I hope there are other groups out there who are actually going to be doing similar work. When we come back, we're going to talk about climate change on an international level. Welcome back. Young people have been the main driving force in conservation work in Fiji, the Pacific and internationally. With us to talk about some of what the work is around the world is Alisi Rambukawanga Naveba. Alisi, we were talking about BAI, the more urban youth organization, but on an international level, there is a major movement with the youth. What do you think that's driving that? It's, it's the urgency of needing to take action because of climate change. But um, do you think that the, do the youth think that the government bodies and various organizations and adults and parents are not doing enough? Partly maybe, and I'd also like to think that it is because of the work that has been done from the generations before that have built up to this stage where young people feel that they can be part of the conversation and they have a seat at the table. Maybe not in all the places where they would like to, but they you know, are empowered and confident enough that they would stand up internationally mm. and say, we also have a voice because we're the ones who are going to be inheriting this. Absolutely. And we do not want to inherit something that's broken. That's and right. we want to be part of the conversation on how you use it right now. That's right. I mean, I think a lot of this has also got to do with that fabulous young person, Greta Thunberg. Uh, you know, how do you see her position uh, going up the United Nations? And, you know, and the words that she spoke there, which I'm getting goosebumps just mm. thinking about what she said, you know, meaning you're destroying our world. How dare you do that? Mm. And what kind of effect do you think that has? I think, it's, I think it's really powerful that, you know, a young person like Greta, I think the story is a year ago, she did a, a, a protest on her own, mm -hmm. sitting there with her signboard. I mean, it's, it's like a very famous picture. Yes, yes, of course. And then fast forward a year later, you have protests, like school strikes all across the world, just, you know, like this cascading effect that just like how it just amplified is amazing. Um, and part of it, I think, is also because we have to recognize her power and her position in a European country, 
her upbringing and the resources that she has access to that allows her to amplify that, that work and also to recognize that she does not work alone but in partnership and with allies across the mm -hmm. world and even in the Pacific we have young amazing advocates and activists who have been working for mm -hmm. years you know we have um, Brianna Fruin from mm. Samoa. She's been working since she was 10 years old. Right. Um, in Fiji, we have Anne Mary Randuva. She has this whole, um, uh, what's this, no to balloons uh, campaign that she yes. runs. Yes. You yes. know, yes. these yes. young people are all coming up, yes. they're all speaking out. And that's part of it too, everyone working together across the world. Why is it then that, um, you know, I've seen it in Australia, I've seen it around the world, where some global leaders are saying, what do these children think they're doing? You know, they should be in school, they should be at class and not walking out in the streets protesting. W what do you say to that? I say that protesting is also part of the learning and part of the process. Mm. You know, these young people are learning. You know, you're learning in a classroom and you're also applying. Yeah. They're learning in the classroom that there are all these environmental impacts. They're learning in the classroom that there are all these things happening. So what do they do about it? They're applying it. You don't have to wait until you graduate and gra get a job mm -hmm. and then you start doing something. Mm -hmm. You can do something right now. And that's what these young people are doing. And that's commendable. And for people to criticize that and to tell them to go back to school, well, I say that's so short-sighted. They're, they're unable to see you know, beyond, like, I don't know. I couldn't really say. It's just that well, I, thought I it was, um, I thought it was a very one-sided affair because you fight for what belongs to you. And, and I suspect that that's what you know, the movement is about. You were also part of um, COP23. And you went to, um, was it in Germany? In Bonn. In Bonn, in Germany, um, where you attended the, uh, the, the COP uh, yeah. meeting. Uh, what was that like and what was your capacity? What, did you, what capacity did you attend that in? Well, I went as a, a CSO representative um, and also to represent, you know, like part of it also was from Boa Urban Youth. And for me, that was the first climate change COP that I attended. And so it was more of a learning process for me. But it was also significant because that was the year Fiji that had the Fiji um, had a very big presence. Uh, we were given the leadership and our prime minister was that leader. Yeah. And there was a lot of hope going into COP23 that a lot of the things that we wanted, you know, would be pushed through. What do you mean by that? that um, a lot of things you wanted. Like uh, the calls from the Pacific, um, you know, calls. Are you saying that it, it, that it didn't happen? I'm saying that for the last 25 years, they've still been having the same conversation. Who? Countries, parties to the convention. Um, and the conversations on were? reduction of uh, fossil fuel emissions, countries to take responsibility, industrial countries, the extraction of fossil fuels to stop that or limit it, uh, transitioning to renewable energy sources because... But how does that relate to Fiji or say the Pacific? Because we're not an industrial nation and we don't emit the high, we don't have the highest mm. rate of carbon emission mm. as do places like China and India the more industrial nations, um, on a local platform, how can Fiji, or have we actually led by example in our own way, with our own, um, the human participation to the pollution of the environment? Okay, okay, I, I, I hear two parts, I'll answer. Internationally, you know, we are the least contributors, yes. but we are at the forefront with sea level rise, yes. more intense cyclones more frequently, and it impacts us. It and impacts so, us, but that's the, the problem is that's the cause of yeah. the industrial nations. And then the other question you're asking, because we had the presidency and we've had leadership, have we shown example, good examples? Yes. yes. I, I think the answer is not in the way, well, for me personally, I would have hoped. I mean, an example would be the bauxite mining and the extractions. Mm -hmm. um, again, repeating what I said earlier, that we cannot tell communities what to do and we cannot say no to extractives. Mm -hmm. But we have a responsibility to ensure that the consultation process and all the conversations are well informed and that they would have, you know, 
without impeding on their rights. Mm. And that hasn't happened. Right. Yeah. And, you know, we see a lot of examples on the news about development and extraction and destruction Clearing that has happened. Clearing of forests. Yes. Um, you know, pollution in the air from carbon dioxide, from all the, the, yeah. the smoke that comes, the exhaust that comes out of the cars. Yeah. All these different things. And um, we can do more locally. Mm. Okay. So, uh, you know, I think one of the things here that is probably very important to know is how can we as citizens of Fiji and the Pacific contribute to a cleaner environment for a longer life? Mm -hmm. It's very difficult to control the rising sea levels because mm -hmm. we're not causing it, but we are being affected by it in a terrible, terrible way mm -hmm. to, the, to the tune where, you know, the communities that are being wiped out and people having to move uphill. Yeah. Just very quickly. You know, part of it is what's been happening for the last 25 years at the COP. Being present internationally and telling people we are here in the Pacific, not small island developing states, we right. are large ocean states. We also have a place, we have a right to exist and we have a right to thrive. And we can call out these countries because we have the moral authority because we're not causing the problem. That's right. You know, that's one and part of every it. Every single person in this region needs to go out and say that. Yes. And locally, you know, we talk about recycling, putting your rubbish in the bin, you know, not all of these other things, watching what you burn, watching what you pour down the sink. And, and that's great, but there's also pollution in landfill. And what we need to recognize is we shouldn't put the burdens on ourselves as individuals. We should also look at the companies that are creating all these products. Now, that, that is another <laughs> big subject, Alisi, a very, very important subject. <laughs> We've run out of time, yeah. and I'd love to have you back on the show. It's so inspiring to hear about how young people are rising to the challenge to tackle some of the world's biggest problems. But that's all we have time for tonight. So join us again on Point every Monday at 8 p.m. right here on my TV.